Greetings, and thank you for joining us for today's event, The New Standards, a conversation on centering inclusivity and in jazz programming and shifting the narrative within the culture. I'm Willie Santiago. I'm the manager of programs and resources for APAP, and I'm a fair-skinned Hispanic person with brown eyes, brown medium-length wavy hair, and I am wearing a teal shirt. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that APAP is located in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway and Acostan and Pamunkey people who have stewarded these lands throughout the generations. And I would like to pay my respects to the elders, both past, present, and future. Closed captioning will appear automatically on your screen. If you would like to disable the chat transcript, please click more on the bottom of the Zoom window and hide subtitle. We are also joined today by ASL interpreters from Purple, Karen Roya and Rhonda Cunningham. Thank you both for joining us for our event today. At APAP, we offer opportunities for year-round networking. We have a series of affinity groups that allow you to connect with your peers and they will be meeting throughout the spring. As a reminder, while we do welcome allyship within our membership, the groups are solely for people who identify with the content of that specific group. We also have upcoming programming. Um, we have two our artist mobility series organized by Thomas Dot that are centered around current visa issues. And then on May 10th, we will also have APAP's Listening Lounge Real Talk in Real Time, where it's an opportunity for you to come and ask us questions that you may have. For more information on our programming, you can visit apap365.org slash programs. <laughs> I will now turn things over to Krista Bradley, our Director of Programs and Resources. Thanks, Willie. Hi, everybody. It's really great to see you. I see some familiar faces um, on the screen. We're so happy to have you here. And we're especially excited about this, this conversation for, for all the reasons, but for so, so many reasons. Um, we're thrilled to have this amazing panel and Terry Lynn with us. And um, this is exciting for us too, you know, with APAP being the uh, National Service Advocacy and Membership Organization, in addition to trying to um, provide you with the resources and information that you need to um, ensure we have a robust presenting, booking, and touring industry, um, we're also about moving the needle and about changing the culture about how we do our work um, as a result of the, the last several years we've come out of. Um, one of the things that uh, we're, we're really proud of is our commitment to READY, Race, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and our 10-20-30 pledge, um, which we um, launched back in 2021. Um, and uh, Willie, if you could put that into the, the chat, that would be great, or put it up on the screen, which I already see. Um, the 10-20-30 pledge is really about calling in the field to, um, I uh, over the next 10 years, looking at their resources and um, how they program to, to take 20% of their programming uh, and their resources to invest in work by, for, and about um, people of color, women, LGBTQIA plus persons and those with disabilities. And um, in terms of this project and the ways that this project are, uh, is calling us into changing the narrative, changing the culture, changing the way that we look at jazz, so it reaches its full potential is so in line um, with our 10, 20, 30 pledge and um, all the values that ready that APAP has. So we're excited about that. I'm gonna stop talking and I wanna set some context for our conversation. So um, sit back and watch a short video that will introduce this project. Standards is not just a book, not just an album, it's not just an exhibit, it's actually the theme of what we're trying to do in jazz, set new standards. What is a standard? There are going to be a lot of themes, um, especially coming from uh, the 20th century, right? And in vaudeville, coming out of Broadway, a lot of Cole Porter tunes. They were popular songs, so everybody knew them. And jazz musicians would take these songs and put their spin on them. The standards became a vessel for jazz musicians to improvise over. It's wonderful music, absolutely. You learn a lot from it, and it is 
great in its historical context, but we're missing a lot of representation from women in that. We were having this event celebrating the opening of the Institute, and I asked the student musicians to find some songs in the real book written by women composers. But the only song they could find was Willow Weep For Me, written by Anne Ronell. Willow Weep For Me. I figured, well, this has to change. That immediately became the first initiative of the Institute, and we need a whole book of songs by women composers. These are things that are always evolving. This publication is corrective work. It can shift the lens of what we consider a standard, what should have been considered a standard this entire time. Sarah Cassie is a composer that I was not aware of, but she was someone who historically did influence a lot of great Detroit musicians back in the day. We talk about standards, it's not only standard what it means in music, but also what it represents in society. Most instrumentalists that you see um, on the big stage that are doing, you know, commercially well um, are men. That's why a lot of young women feel that they're concerned that they won't have opportunities to pursue a career in this music at the level that they want to attain eventually. because of their gender. I didn't really feel it until I started leading my own bands. Now, while the time fails to pass. You know, jazz has come a long way, but it's still, there are still many conservative parts of jazz. Why is it still a shock? to people when they see me play and they, they've never seen me play before. Like, why are, why are people impressed by the fact that I'm a woman and I play? And it's something I still experience, that feeling of you're not really supposed to be here. I mean, on the way here to this interview, two different guys stopped me and were like, that bass is too big for you. You're so small. What are you doing with that? I had someone come up and say, you sound so great. You sounded like a man. Yeah, you feel a lot of that. You go through it. You figure out how to get around it. I was raised by a, a very strong woman and a great, great female jazz musician and composer, Alice Coltrane. The Blue Nile is uh, one of Alice's uh, best known compositions. I had a few opportunities to play it with her. I also recorded the tune with her. Terry Lynn asked me to play on this really incredible uh, composition written by the harpist Brandy Younger called Respected Destroyer. Talk about a, a new standard that's really becoming a, a popular tune. When I was younger, I was much more conscious of my gender. I was much more conscious of how I was perceived by male musicians. It made me adjust my behavior accordingly, you know, which shouldn't have to do that. I think this book is seminal to the transformation that needs to happen in the 21st century for women in jazz. That question comes up, you know, what does jazz sounds without patriarchy? I do think the aesthetic would absolutely be different. It would be more beautiful if you ask me. That is both inspiring and provocative, and we get a chance to delve deeper uh, into these topics uh, with an amazing panel. Terry Lynn Carrington, founder and artistic director of the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, artistic director of the Carr Center, multiple Grammy Award winner is here uh, with us. Um, her partner uh, at the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, Asia Burrell Wood is joining us today. Oliver Ragsdale, who's the president of the Carr Center in Detroit, and Alicia Mack, Alicia Mack, booking agent at International Music Network. Welcome, everybody. 
It's great to have you here. Um, and thanks for that wonderful video, which really uh, outlined a number of, of the topics that we want to talk about today. Um, and I just love that question. What would jazz sound like without the patriarchy? Um, Terry Lynn, we heard a little about the vision and scope um, of the New Standards Project, but can you share your inspiration and vision for this initiative um, when you conceived it and, and what you're hoping to see in, in the change that you're, you're calling for? Yes, well, um, thank you for having me, first of all. It's a very nice gathering of people. Happy to be here. I think Alicia had the best picture up there with all those flowers <laughs> that made me want to run outside into a flower bed and hope that spring comes even quicker. Um, yes, I think it's all about changing the culture. And uh, this project is just another way of addressing the same topic. Um, our institute, though it's housed at Berkeley College of Music, our initiatives uh, are elsewhere, are hopefully everywhere. Um, and it's all collective work and we like partnering with other people, other entities, presenters, uh, museums, uh, other people that are concerned about the art form itself. I always say anybody that's involved with jazz at all, it has to be for the love of the music. We certainly know it's not for the money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you really truly love the music, um, it's now, we're at a time where everybody has to do their part in moving the music forward and uh, making the music, uh, you know, stand up to all of its potential and uh, be the best it can be. And that means us being the best that we can be. Uh, so all of that is under our banner at the Institute of the Jazz Without Patriarchy Project. Um, the initiative for, uh, well, the first was there was a book <laughs> first um new standards 101 101 lead sheets by women composers and then i did an album new standards volume one which is 11 of those compositions and then i partnered with the car center to do an ex uh, exhibition or installation um, involving many jazz artists that also do visual work uh, and involving performances uh, shining a light on uh, women's stories like Jerry Allen and Mary Lou Williams or uh, through oral histories, compiling oral histories of Alberta Hunter, Melba Liston, uh, Lil Hardin Armstrong, and really just kind of, kind of coming at this topic uh, in different ways uh, and almost kind of trying to create a, a takeover, a new <laughs> standards takeover so that if you walked into the space or you were around for what we call the jazz crawl, which was uh, being able to go hear different performances in the same day in a general neighborhood that you could walk to all the performances. Uh, if you were around for that, you couldn't possibly leave without feeling transformed, without wondering, you know, why uh, have I not been thinking about this more or what can I do? Uh, for this, you know, issue because uh, until there's equity with the people that uh, create the music, but also, you know, the people that are the stakeholders uh, in the music and sometimes gatekeepers, without uh, equity in all of those areas, uh, the music uh, will be lacking something and will not reach its full potential. Thank you for that. I think I heard a lot of things about transformation and kind of multifaceted approach to um, really changing the culture, both getting, shining the light and making people more visible and then giving them the resources and lifting up the work um, and then showcasing the work so that more people are, are seeing it. So um, I'm, I'm struck with the fact that many layers are involved in this work, right? And, and many layers are involved with this kind of shift, right? As you just outlined, and it, it feels pretty monumental to, to create this movement and to to see it um, make a difference and because there's so much to unpack and there's so many of us that play a role in, in you know, gatekeeping and touring and putting resources towards it. Um, what do you all see as the necessary um, 
are the necessary partners in this work to make this happen? You talked about a project, which we'll, we'll go into more details with the CAR Center, but um, as we try to shift the narrative and change the culture, um, who should be part of that work and how can their roles evolve? And that's open to all of you because you all have a different perspective on the work, but um, yeah, how would you how would you answer that question? Who do you want to go first? <laughs> Everyone. Who's yeah, that's, 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 that's my answer. All Everybody. the people, all the people from A to Z is the, is the, is the short answer. Um, I'll certainly let, let Terry Lynn or, or Asia or Oliver speak about it, but it, it really is A to Z and it's work every day, every single day. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. You have to, you almost start at zero again, the next one, and you just have to do the work every day. So um, I'll let you guys speak a little bit about the experience of, of mounting the exhibit and, and working on this project. But, you know, for me, that's the short answer. Yeah, definitely um, everyone. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, and co-signing on that from what Alicia said, is it's absolutely everyone. I love how you put the, put, it in terms of A to Z because A to Z is how we got here, right? Um, so it takes A to Z to keep in those problematic structures in place at every level from presenting to education, to the artistry, to the business um, part of that. So we can't shift the culture without touching every part of how the culture exists in the first place. Or, or, or there's, or there will be no shift. And I think that it, while we call all of the uh, uh, the artists, the presenters, the curators, the community is another key component to um, the success of of this, so that um, they become um, the audiences for all of the variety of activities, uh, whether it's the book, whether it's the CD, whether it's the installation, um, the films, um, all of those types of things. We need the community as a key component in helping to shift the narrative. Mm. You all worked in partnership to see a lot of that happen in Detroit. And I think, you know, you've named a number of the different elements. And I think for people that are not familiar with all the things that happened in that pilot, would be good to just break that down. So um, the partnership between Terry Lynn, the Carr Center, Berkeley Center for uh, Jazz and Justice included a number of different elements, right? Can you all walk us through, um, first of all, I wanna learn more about the Carr Center, just what, what the organization does and how it's situated. And then how did you partner on with this project in terms of the elements that really lifted um, the different pieces up and 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 shared it with the community. I'd love to like to hear you walk us well, through that. Well, uh, thanks thanks for having us and being a um, you know it's been a real honor um, and an exhilarating and sometimes exhausting um, experience in going through um, this process. Um, the Car Center uh, is 32 years old and uh, we are a multidisciplinary uh, presenter focusing on African and African American arts and the arts of the diaspora. Uh, we do dance, theater, music, visual arts, art exhibitions. Um, we have a twitch towards jazz, uh, but recently we're involved in a uh, commissioning project of uh, seven African-American um, chamber music uh, composers, uh, including Patrice Russian in that chamber music uh, uh, element. Um, and we've been working on the new standards, shifting the narrative, um, jazz and uh, gender justice uh, project for about three years now. Um, Terry Lynn and I were sitting down one day. Uh, Terry Lynn's been our artistic director um, for several years. And uh, one day we were sitting down and she said, I have an idea. And um, anytime that Terry Lynn um, has an idea, um, what we've learned is that, that an idea turns into an explosion. And um, the good thing about the explosion um, and a Terry Lynn idea is that um, you get all of her and you get all of that brain power, you get all of that creativity. Um, and uh, that's how uh, this began to evolve. Um, and then the Doris Duke Foundation uh, funded a seed program and uh, we went through um, a year of weekly meetings, designing a 
7,500 square foot installation with uh, through a partnership with the, the University of Michigan um, School of Ar Architecture and Urban Planning. Um, and when we couldn't find a venue for 7,500 7, square feet, uh, we decided to put it into in the car center um, as we opened the new facility um, last October. And it was a 2,500 square foot uh, facility. And we decided to have the various elements that Terry Lynn had been thinking about with an emphasis on new standards, but all of the components of the overall shifting the narrative uh, project were represented within that. Um, and when I mentioned the community, um, through a partnership with Midtown Detroit, uh, we're located in the cultural center and we were able to bring together um, a nine venues um, in the neighborhood who all presented concerts that uh, Terry Lynn curated, we put into the spaces and uh, 13 performances over eight um, evenings um, in nine venues. Uh, we had an actual, we called it a crawl because there were always at least two performances and you could go from one to the other. And the organizations ranged from a small uh, visual arts space, the uh, Scarab Club, to the Detroit Institute of Arts and um, uh, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, uh, Max Fisher uh, Cube uh, space in, in our space, Charles Wright Museum of African American History, et cetera. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, that would be true. Um, Terry Lynn, how did you uh, conceive and think about the different elements? I mean, obviously you're curating for the performances, but why a visual art exhibit um, and the other pieces that you did in community? Um, I, I think it's a big part of uh, how artists are thinking these days. It's It's where artists are going. You know, they're not and most artists I know aren't one dimensional. Mm -hmm. You know, we appreciate and know a little something, you know, of, in these other areas. Um, and I just have found myself over the last few years, or maybe I don't know, it's been longer than a few years, but over some years now, uh, wanting to do more collaborations with other people. But if I look back, even 20 years ago, I mean, I wrote music for dance companies. Um, and, you know, I, I like to write. So for this, you know, I knew I wanted to write a script, an imaginary story about Jerry Allen and Mary Lou Williams, a meeting that they never had. Um, and I know so many you know, friends, artists, vocalists, jazz artists that are also visual artists. So I wanted to include some of their work. So we had, um, pieces by Cecile McLaurin Salvant and Carmen Lundy, uh, Jasmia Horn. Uh, she makes her own clothing and I noticed something she had on one day that was stunning and she told me she made it. So I thought, let me imagine her dressing Ella Fitzgerald. And so we made that work. Um, she designed something you know, beautiful and uh, freeing in a sense for Ella. And um, and Mary Lou Williams, we had pieces of her artwork. A lot of people didn't know that she was a visual artist as well. Uh, Liz Wright is a, a culinary artist. So we had her design, uh, design, um, what's the word? <laughs> we had her put together a recipe <laughs> and popped. <laughs> curate, curate a menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a special recipe specifically that we put on a recipe card and, um, that people could take with them. And served it. Yeah, and, and, we, and served it, yeah. So it was, you know, a all-encompassing uh, event, you know, and I also wanted to make sure there was live music inside of the uh, exhibit itself. That's amazing. And so did the exhibit come first and then there was a jazz crawl or was it, um, Kind of did that uh, lay the groundwork for people and then you you did another uh, uh, simultaneous we, we opened the we opened the exhibit we had live music on the night that we um did the opening and then the next day uh we had an incredible panel uh with um gina uh, i always i wasn't prepared to say that so i didn't think say the names uh asia 
Uh, um, with uh, uh, Gina Dent, um, Angela Davis, <laughs> and who and Terry Lynn was also on the panel was um, also Robin Kelly. That's it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, as soon as the panel was over, the jazz crawl started in three locations, and we did it um, hour of uh, hour hour and fifteen minute type sets and moved on from place to place to place. The first weekend we did Friday Saturday. Next weekend we did Thursday Friday. Following weekend we did Friday Saturday until we went all the way through. Um, a couple venues did multiple days. Um, Car Center did um, almost every day we did one um, with it. And it was also part of driving people to come through the installation. And um, we would show the film, people would play uh, with, we had a um, hands-on version of the book that uh, people could touch and go through, hear uh, samples of, et cetera. That's great. And can I just say also that um, the film that what you just showed was an excerpt of a film that's 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes. Hmm. Um, and each of the, there's four sections of this installation. And each component has a film. So it's a pretty um, ambitious project. And so it's we just opened, beginning. <laughs> we, and we opened the, uh, the uh, next um, film um, was the Carrie Mae Weems project. Um, that we open on May the 6th and um, do another concert with Micheline Thomas and Terry Lynn collaborating um, on a project in a contemporary, in the MOCAD, which is the Contemporary Art um, Museum in Detroit. Uh, we're partnering with them um, to do that presentation on May the 5th. Yeah. So that's I'm three of the four components. And I would also like to add, um, you know, based on the you know type of presentation that this is and was, um, all the components and also the way that it was so thoughtfully planned to be, you know, into engaging the the city and the community. It was such great evidence for how, when you can accomplish um, these type of presentations, um, how dynamically audiences can be in, engaged and they absolutely uh they absolutely were and so it was really wonderful to see this um type of execution and uh delivery and i think that's the power uh in this and it wasn't just where you know people are coming to a show where people are coming to an exhibit it was fully um it was fully conceived and people really understood that so it was wonderful to see people engaging in that way and activate it. Exactly. Yeah, the, I'm just struck with the multiple layers of the work. And, and I know that there are a lot of um, programmers and curators um, on the call. And, um, you know, and looking at the APAP universe, so many uh, folks, uh, when they are curating and programming, they are they are thinking beyond what's happening on stage. And, and how do you make a, a really rich engagement that's 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 more than two or three days. That's that's multi uh, faceted. That's multi layered and and an extensive uh, kind of opportunities for people to find different ways into the work and different ways to um, engage with artists. And it seems like this is such a great example um, of that and advancing a different and um, way forward um, with jazz. So that's that's super exciting. You underscored, I think, a little bit already why you thought it worked well, and it sounds like um, it was it was successful in terms of who came out and um, uh, how the community, um, you know, was participatory and um, excited about it. But what would you say? Um, what else would you say made it successful, and what did you learn in the process um, of doing this project? I th I think there was. Um, it was accessible. I mean, it, and it was accessible at a level. And I think sometimes when we are presenting and um, especially very advanced work, especially in elite spaces, spaces alone um, can automatically make 
people in certain communities or certain segments of populations feel that they are unwelcomed. I think that this community also in all of the work that was uh, in, in conversations, right, including the panel, I think they also yeah. saw themselves in it as well. Um, the community itself was represented. There was a, a, um, it also including, because there were people in artist and work included in um, the exhibit and um, those presentation that were also from that community as well, um, or, or, or from communities like a, um, like a Detroit. So I think, um, and, and, and so it wasn't just here, you should know this, you should, um, this is important. <laughs> which is sometimes uh, as a bit of, of the ethos, I think, in presenting on um, this is us, right? We are, is, is, this is a we. Um, and I think that just really came through as well. And, I, and, I, and it's important, I, th I think, for us to be mindful of that. But the community was represented in every single part of mm -hmm. that work. And that matters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I just want to interject quickly because as somebody who's not an artist or a creative, I, w I went to the exhibit at the Car Center and um, spent the weekend there. And I was so personally moved by the work, by the music, by the exhibit, by the film. Um, and I think what the message represents is a shift in the narrative beyond just the arts it's 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 a it sort of has to be a global movement I mean I I sat there and I thought wow how many other women are agents and managers how many other women um have come up for 25 years like me uh, I have very few female peers in in my job um and that was really powerful to take stock in and to sort of realize. And so I think the message is, um, you know, it, it's truly shifting the narrative on all things. Um, and I think that that's what can be really powerful for audiences. Um, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're a, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, you're a cab driver. I mean, there aren't many people that necessarily look like you doing those jobs. And it's, um, yeah, it, for me, it was, it was way powerful. I was, it, you know, they say it's pretty rare you can surprise yourself. Right. And so, um, I was incredibly surprised by my like visceral reaction from the work. So, um, I just want to, you know, say that, that I think that this goes way beyond just jazz or even the arts. So something to think about, you know, as we're moving forward and trying to do the, do the work. Thanks, Alicia. Terry, let anything to add? I think the one, the, the one, the one thing about it is the work is never done. And there, there's sort of a little bit of symbolism to um, the fact that we were still working on and tweaking the exhibition until it opened. And uh, there were always changes. Uh, you see Terry Lynn smiling. She knows <laughs> what we went through. Uh, uh, there, and uh, we, we were opening a new facility at the same time we were opening this, this new um, uh, installation. And um, the evolution of it um, started and things were added. Uh, we ended up with an illustrated storybook just because during the course of the conversations, the meetings that we had, weekly meetings, uh, we ended up with a book. And one of the people on our project team used to be president of Marvel Comics. And that started us looking at creating a, a, this illustrated book. Um, and, and the project continues to live and is never done um, as we work on the, the next components and the next components. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute when you, um, but everybody's speaking so uh, eloquently that I really don't have much to add, but I just realized um, 
I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Well, you know, we, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk about this was what, you know, I, I think it's a really great example of seeing how this initiative played out um, as a partnership with a presenter and artist um, and community and wondering how this could be inspirational and instructional, um, you know, to our, to our members and to our field. Um, what, what do you want to see happen after this? I mean, you, you launched this amazing project. There are various elements. Um, what do you want to see happen next? And how can, you know, fellow presenters, fellow artists, um, other agent and managers and other people in our ecosystem play a role to see this, this work advance? Well, personally, I think um, it's, it's a cultural shift that we're bringing up that needs to happen and everybody has to do it for it to happen. So uh, like we said earlier, so uh, everybody knows their roles. They know where patriarchy has guided them, even the women, right? Especially the women, you know, we have been, you know, participated in this problem uh, as well. And patriarchy has hurt men probably more than women in some ways, um, or I won't say more, but it's definitely hurt men. Uh, so I think, you know, we you look at your life, you look at your work, you look at the intersection of the two and you know, what, what you can do to move jazz forward uh, or the arts forward. Um, and we're in you know, a time period where you know, these words of equity and transformation are being said quite a bit. Uh, and I don't ever, you know, I hope that it never becomes uh, words that have less meaning you know, to people because they're used so often now. Uh, because it, we're still, you know, working toward these things. And um, I'm very happy to say that I feel a shift happening. I feel things moving in the right direction. Um, I'm an optimist, so um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I, would, I would not be doing all this work if I thought it was impossible for things to move. Uh, and I also want to, you know, again, acknowledge Dara Stuke because we would not have been able to do this without uh, their funding to kick it off. Um, and it even just, even if, you know, you know, you have to, you know, fundraise more, the fact that somebody believed in it from the beginning and uh, said, yeah, you know, let's go, let's do it, was really important because, you know, for me, as the first time I did something like this and, uh, you know, that kind of support uh, is, is needed. Uh, and this, th th that, pr that particular grant was for, I guess, I forget if they said mid, mid career artists, uh, that had a little bit of experience, but not a lot with a multidisciplinary work. So, you know, I felt like, um, yeah, I felt very, cause I know there are a lot of artists that fall in that category. So I, I felt very, um, fortunate and have a lot of gratitude to them for that. As far as uh, other stakeholders, uh, yeah, I mean, presenters, I think, always have to take risks to some degree. I'm sure Oliver, and he can speak to this, uh, you know, in a minute, but I'm sure Oliver, I know, I'm not going to say I'm sure, I know <laughs> Oliver, you know, in the beginning, you know, was like, wow, okay, then we're going to go out on a limb a little bit here. Um, because <laughs> You know, in the jazz world, or even just some communities, people aren't talking about patriarchy. People aren't talking about non-binary, uh, you know, female and non-binary. Some communities, of course, there are communities where people are talking about it. But some of the sometimes it feels, you know, pretty polarized. Uh, you know, within some of the communities, and jazz has not been uh, the most progressive. You know, in these ways. So um, I think it's you know important for jazz to really um, I don't want to say completely like take his head out of the sand, but there's more to it than how great you play, how great and wonderful the music is, because it is, and we all know that. And I think jazz has survived 
th this long and you know has been something you know kind of an oasis for many people because of the richness of the music but there's also been things to challenge and to criticize uh, so I think we all have to look at that and yeah sometimes there is there is risk taking involved uh, to to do certain things that you just you don't know how it will respond or and you know foundations corporations um, you know all all those people that uh, are trying to make the world better uh, yeah you know they they need to you know look at this gender issue of course at um, you know the uh, racial justice as well which is being talked about a lot uh, and this particular project intersects both. And, and I think that um, as the presenter, um, it really pushed pushed our envelope um, uh, because uh, Terry Lynn's creativity is sort of boundless. And um, we tried to match um, and, and deliver on all of the things that were part of the, part of the vision. Um, I think on a practical um, side, um, in terms of what people can do, um, Invite the installation to come into your community. Um, replicate uh, the jazz crawl and the other opportunities, programmatic elements um, that took place um, as a way of starting a snowball uh, within your community. Um, as I said, we're going to be doing um, another two sections in another couple weeks, um, and that's sort of our snowball um, uh, res response to it. Um, as I look at as I look at Carson's work, um, I see a really strong commitment to um, female um, everything, and um, I'm really I'm really proud of that. It started with Jerry Allen, who's mm -hmm. our first artistic director, um, and has continued um, along in that in that realm. Um, so invite it in. And to to that point, Oliver, I would say uh, to encourage presenters to look to artists whether they're in their community or that are, you know, national touring artists and bring them in. I think, you know, there are certain big performing arts centers that have an artist at the head that sort of helps to drive things. But I think that, um, I think every performing arts center, every organization, whether it's a festival or, you know, whatever it is could really, um, it's value added to have an artist there to help curate and to help share with you um, sort of, you know, what happens behind the curtain and, and, and what really needs to be done beyond just, oh, they just want a Grammy or they've got a song that people are super into, or this is a, you know, this is a message. I think that an artist can really help you do, do the work. So, don't just think about artists as putting them on stage, but bring them in to the back office, help them do the work, help to help you do the work that um, really needs to be done. Um, so, I mean, for me, I would encourage every, uh, you know, presenter to really, you know, have an artist on staff or, or somebody who can help you curate the season. I mean, I know that, and that's to take nothing away from the presenters. They're out there seeing all the music and doing the work, but um, it's it's a different it's a different um, scope. It's a different vision, and I think that it's value added for sure. So that would be my two cents. Thank you, Asia. Did you want to say any more? Let's put no, on the show. Look at. I think I think it's been said. <laughs> I think it's so too, and I I really um I'm so excited about this project. I'm so excited that you've been here to raise it up and and just want to note, you know, there's so much we're talking about in, in terms of equity and racial justice. We don't hear it so much around gender. Um, so I really appreciate the intersectionality of what we're talking about. And particularly in, you know, this particular art form. Um, and uh, we don't just don't talk about it. And so I think it's really important to raise that up and to continue co having that conversation. Um, so many programmers and presenters have um, are, are committed to um, changing the narrative about their role in their community, what they're putting on stage, how they're lifting up artists' voices and 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 partnering with artists' voices um, to 
to make a difference. Um, so I, I, I'm excited about what you're raising here and um, just thank you for that. I know that there's some questions already percolating um, and we we're gonna ask you all to put them in the chat, but I think that we're a small enough group that um, we could just open it up if that's okay. And I think Alicia and Jack at the Office of the Arts in Harvard might have something to ask. So Alicia. Hi, thanks, Krista. Hello, APAP colleagues, and thank you, panelists, for this uh, really interesting discussion of your project. Hey, Terry Lynn, how are you doing? Uh, good to see you. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the programmatic and the presenting part of it, and I'm in the position of what happens kind of before that, which is with the young people who are coming through jazz programs um, at the high school and the college level, and even if we program and present certain artists, the fact is um, our jazz band here is primarily white and primarily male. And I think that's true for most jazz bands at colleges. Um, so I wonder, you know, Terry Lynn, you said you wanted to go out on a limb at that level that you were at with the car center. How do you go out on a limb before that to set up the world a different way at the educational level? Um, you know, let's just say at a college that maybe isn't a conservatory, you know, but does have a jazz band. I know you've done ter 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 ugh, terrific work across the river from us at Berkeley uh, with your colleagues. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about how we can help set that up at our level um, by recruiting or, you know, bringing mm -hmm. more women into the jazz world at this age. Well, um, especially at your institution, um, it, it's it's really a matter of you know committing to outreach uh, to, to to high schools and middle schools uh, because you have to get to people you know before they get to high school really um, you know or early early on in high school um, but before they get to your school before they get to college. Um, so it, 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 people keep um, dropping off, you know, as, as far as matriculating. Uh, so there's a lot more women, uh, if we're speaking just of gender, and there's a lot more women, uh, young girls playing in middle school, and then they drop off because it's not fun anymore. And they're not getting support from the band directors. So then, you know, high school, same thing starts to happen. Um, so I think um, I mean, we we started an outreach program with Boston Arts Academy, um, and you know we hope to do more. But I think outreach is super important, and it also as far as um, race, it, people one have to start listening and judging differently because you have you know these systems of what designates who is good and who is not, and it does not necessarily always reflect on what I would consider the most important things in jazz, uh, which would be rhythm and the blues. And it does not uh, allow sometimes for uh, the people, like you, people don't, can't always see the potential of, of, of a student. They want you to come fully formed and in some ways, you know, competitive with somebody that had maybe a lot more means, had lessons at a young age, had better instruments, um, you know, had more time to just be creative and, and think about their future. So I think those things uh, systemically have to be looked at in order to make changes because it is a problem and I'm very critical of it and, um, you know, I've discussed it quite a bit. It's a problem. Jazz education is actually helps screw up jazz as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, but somehow, the music is so, you know, incredible <laughs> and the cream still rises to the top. But I, I always say people should not have to be that resilient. You know, people should not have to, you know, plow through, you know, a snowstorm without boots, you know, just to, <laughs> to try to play some jazz. I mean, I would, you know, often people take an easier route. Uh, or a route to more commercial styles um, because they're not getting the support they need. Mm. The other the other thing I would say is um, we have two things. 
um, all of the artists that come, uh, most of the artists that come into town, um, that Terry Lynn brings, uh, brings in um, through her curation, uh, we put them into the schools, into uh, uh, classes, into lectures and things of that sort. Um, and we also have a, um, our house band, if you will, at the Car Center is a, um, uh, a group of, we call them early career professionals, um, 18 to 28 years old, um, who come into residency, um, study, perform, um, take professional development classes, but they also go into the schools. And um, when young people, when high school kids and middle school kids see um, 23 year olds age closer to their own age, um, that has been a, a somewhat a somewhat effective tool. Uh, we're still trying to catch up from COVID too. Mm. Um, there's, there's pretty a, a pretty major um, catch up in Detroit um, tied to um, field trips and other kinds of programs. So it's a, a lot more going into schools than being successful of bringing um, bringing the schools to our programs. Mm. I, yes, and, and and I think in terms of equity aims in um, in education and especially in higher ed, uh, traditionally I think we've one hundred percent missed the mark. Um, in we've we've missed the mark in 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 that we think about it from a standpoint of oh, you know, we would love to see this segment or this population of students, but we just don't know. They just don't apply. They just don't. And we don't evaluate ourselves in it, right? And what are we creating? What structures and what systems and culture are we creating where that is that is absolutely not happening, right? So our modes of evaluation, like Terry, Terry was um, speaking to, what, um, how are we not listening? How are we not seeing? What are our relationships with all of these communities? Right, um, as as well, because if you don't have relationships with certain communities, um, you haven't built trust, you haven't built that uh, over time. Um, then why would those communities um, trust us with their young people? Right, I mean us as institutions. So there's so many ways, but I also just have to um, shout out one of our most successful students at JDJ is also a Harvard dual student and contributed mightily to this project. That is Devin um, Gates as a, as a bass player. And actually Devin came to us also through um, communities that we had relationships with as well. So I think we can, um, as two institutions here, we I think we can um, take great, great, great pride uh, in Devin Gates who will graduate, not this, not right this semester, but very soon. So we can pat ourselves on the back for that. She's going places. I can't wait to meet Devin Gates. Okay, you heard her here, folks. Um, so that's that's great. Um, I see a lot of programmers on the call. And, um, you know, I, I keep hearing um, uh, a phrase in my head, you know, if I'm not a black run BIPOC led organization, um, but I'm committed to this work. Um, you know, how do I kind of um, lean in um, to and get my audiences, you, you know, uh, engaged in this as much as I'm engaged in this? And maybe it's not so different than presenting any other um, artist that might be new to your audience, because that's part of part of your work as a curator, but um, I just wonder if you would offer any suggestions or insight um, for that. And then I have another question for you, uh, Terry Lynn, about the future and, and kind of your role in moving this forward. I think somebody else can maybe answer the first question yeah. um, and I can answer it. Well, I think that, I, I think that the, um, you know, there aren't a, there aren't a, a, a plethora of uh, BIPOC presenters. So um, with that um, understanding, it's take the jazz is, is being presented at colleges and universities and at um, small and medium sized presenters, et cetera, all over the country. Um, you're already doing that. So now here is a package. Here is a topic that can be presented um, that's, that, uh, that exists. Um, and there are these multiple components to it. So if you take the new standards book, um, there's an opportunity for 
musicians to play the the lead sheets from the book, the tunes from the book. Um, if you want to have a listening session, you have the um, recording. Um, there is the uh, full installation, uh, the, uh, electronic programming book that we put together for it. So um, do what you do. Here's the topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for creating all of that too, to be able to share with your fellow colleagues in the field to really move it forward. So uh, Terry Lynn, how, how do you see your role in the future in moving the agenda forward? Well, um, I, I, in, in an interesting way, I mean, I don't really think about the future. I think, of, I mean, I do think about the future, but I think about the present. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, I'm pretty mission oriented and purpose driven. So I feel like my role is happening now. It happens every day, uh, either if I'm at Berkeley or not at Berkeley. If I'm trying to write a song, somebody's going to email me something that I have to respond to. You know, it could be a critic, could be, you know, a scholar, could be a presenting organization, it could be a funder. Uh, you know, I'm, I do countless Zooms uh, just trying to do my part in making sure people are on the right track with, with their thinking on this. Because so many of us, including myself, have had uh, these kinds of awakenings over the last few years. Uh, and like Alicia said, the work is never over. Uh, so my role shifts from being a performer to doing all these other things. I don't have a name for all of it. Of course, you know, there's some curating in there. Uh, there's consulting. Uh, there's, I do A&R for a label. And I do a radio show um, called Future Flavors uh, on Sirius XM. And I had proposed actually a, a show uh, that would highlight women and non-binary artists. And they didn't exactly go for that. And then I realized, oh, my, my you know, other show idea was, about creating new audiences and you know moving the music forward, and I can just make gender justice part of that without telling exactly. them. Exactly. So, <laughs> so that's what I mean. The work you know continues no matter what I do. So um, that's how I that's how I see it. That's a that's a great way to to end our conversation and also inspiration for all of us. You know, um, we have a colleague from our our board that um, told me when I first joined the board before I came on staff is to use your chair. Use your chair for um, promoting and advocating for things that you care about and bring your perspective to that work. And um, Terry Lynn, thank you for using all of the chairs that and places that you that, where you stand and you sit to really advance this work and for being an advocate and showing us um, you know, how powerful the artistic voice um, is and how powerful your voice is as an advocate um, and for inspiring all of us to, to use our space and our resources and our, our voices and our um, influence to make a, a difference. So I just wanna thank you all, um, Alicia, Terry Lynn, Oliver and Asia for being part of today's discussion and for opening all of us up and helping us learn more about this project. Thank you all for being here. Um, I hope that you leave inspired. Um, there are wonderful resources available um, about this project. I'm sure, sure at the Car Center, if there are some um, email websites that, or websites that we need to drop in the chat or put on our website, we will do so. Um, but we hope you have a great day. And we want to thank Duke Foundation again for your vision and for being such an amazing funding partner uh, for this project and for all of us, certainly at APAP. Um, and for seeing how to um, make a difference in this world through the artist lens. So um, have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. And maybe we Thank can you. send you out with some more uh, music from the new standards, Willie. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you so much. Okay.